Coming up on Tech News Today, Google's building a smartwatch, Apple's winning the storage wars, and why Stephen Elop's throwing phones. All that more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Friday, March 22nd, 2013. Tech News Today is brought to you by Pond5, the world's stock media marketplace. If you're a media maker looking for video, photos, illustrations, music, sound effects, after effects templates, or 3D models, check out Pond5. And for an exclusive 50 free stock media files, go to pond5.com slash TNT. And by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform that makes it fast and easy to create a professional website, blog, portfolio, and now an online store. Check out their new commerce solution so you can start selling stuff immediately. For a free trial and 10% off your first purchase on new accounts, go to squarespace.com and use offer code TNT3. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Maya Zaktar. And I'm Jason Howell. And we are like the Avengers of Tech, <laughs> assembling to bring you the top 10 stories of the day in the news. Well, whether you want them or not, get ready for an onslaught of smartwatches, folks. The Financial Times reports that Google's Android unit is developing its own watch separate from Samsung's reported Android effort. And just for good measure, the Korea Times reports LG is not only working on a smartwatch, but their own version of Google Glass as well. EU antitrust regulators may be looking into anti-competitive issues involving the distribution of Apple's iPhones and iPads based on what are called informal complaints from several telecoms operators. This is kind of the latest development in tension between the telecoms industry and content providers, not just from Apple, but Google as well, which provide digital services that run over telecom systems. Their concerns focused on the commercial terms in contracts with Apple. BlackBerry smash! Okay. BlackBerry Z10 is now available in the United States on the AT&T network. 200 bucks buys you BlackBerry's beautiful hardware along with an operating system that some people like. Uh, the Z10 has been available in the UK and Canada for a while. If you want the phone in white and or on the Verizon network, that arrives on the 28th of March. HBO CEO Richard Plepler believes the company has the right business model in the U.S. for now. But told Reuters, maybe HBO Go with our broadband partners could evolve. The idea, according to Reuters, would be to tack an extra 10 or $15 on your monthly broadband bill to access HBO. Plepler said they would have to make the math work. And we all know math's hard. <laughs> Julius Janikowski, speak for yourself, Tom. Julius Janikowski, <laughs> the Federal Communications Commission chairman since June of 2009, has announced he will leave his position in the coming weeks. Janikowski is known for plans to expand broadband internet service throughout the U.S. and to free up additional airwaves for sale to mobile phone companies. A successor has not yet been named. Australia's Standing Committee on Infrastructure held a hearing to find out why companies like Adobe, Apple, and Microsoft charge more for digital goods like software and movies. At the hearing, a Microsoft representative said that market conditions allow for its pricing structure, saying customers will vote with their wallets. Adobe's managing director for Australia tried to move the conversation to Adobe's lower-cost cloud services. Apple said music and movies are more expensive in Australia because of the studios. It's their yeah, fault. Not us. Uh, although we're at fault for the UDID thing, but we're stopping that now. Apple's actually never really encouraged developers to use a phone's UDID and apps, but now it will be banned altogether. Starting May 1st, Apple will block all apps or updates to existing apps that use the UDID. That unique number has been used to target ads and track apps. Hackers have also previously accessed lists of UDIDs collected by app developers. Apple is now bulletproof. Well, that's not true. But it has enabled two-step authentication for iCloud and other services accessed by user Apple IDs. The system will provide an extra layer of security on top of existing Apple ID passwords when users want to access their accounts from an unrecognized device. If you'd like to participate, go to appleid.apple.com, sign in, and click the password and security tab. 
China has often tried to escape reliance on outside software makers by creating homegrown operating systems like Red Flag Linux, for instance. Here comes another one. Canonical will collaborate with the Chinese Ministry of Industry and Information Technology on a version of Ubuntu OS called Kylin, intended for desktop and laptop computers. The deal is part of a five-year plan to get people to use more open source software. The headline reads, How Dongle Jokes Got Two People Fired and Led to DDoS Attacks. But the headline's not from The Onion, it's from Ars Technica. The story starts in an annual Python developer conference. SendGrid developer evangelist Adria Richards didn't care for two developers cracking sexual jokes about forking repos, nor their discussions of big dongles. So she tweeted about the incident and asked the conference organizers to take action. After the conference, one of the joking developers was fired, Richards was also fired, and her blog got hit with an apparent denial of service attack. Richards' former company, SendGrid, also experienced a DOS. Anonymous is taking credit for it, or at least that's what's said on a pastebin post. This episode of Tech News Today brought to you by Pond5. If you make your own media out there, you know how hard it is to find not only good but legal uses of things like photos, illustrations, B-roll, vector graphics, motion graphic templates, 3D models. Well, all of those things are available and more. In fact, there's more than 10 million of the ex examples of them at Pond5, P-O-N-D-5.com. If you're a developer, uh, use Pond5 for high-quality sound effects for your games and get some, some clip art in there. Designers can use Pond5 so you don't have to build everything from scratch. If you're a film or a video maker, Pond5's HD footage gets you just the right shot. Anything you can think of. You can search in there and find multiple examples of it. Uh, I definitely use it for sound effects a lot. Uh, and I know a lot of folks who use it. Uh, in, in fact, a colleague of mine who does an online video show uses it constantly for just, you know, little pieces of B-roll in there. You never know. But if you're an artist, you're going to love this. You get to sell your stuff on there, too. Pond5 gives you control over the pricing, and that is unheard of. You'll pay out 50% royalties for each and every sale. That's a higher payout than other stock photo marketplaces. As a result, the prices are unbeatable. The selection is vast. And this month, you can get 50 free stock media files to try it out at pond5.com slash TNT. So show your support for Tech News Today. Go download some free stock media files. Start using Pond5, and we thank them for their support of Tech News Today. Joining us now, like Spider-Man joining the Avengers of Tech, is Darren Kitchen. Of Hack5, <laughs> hak5.org. Don't How's hurt me, there? Darren. <laughs> How are you guys doing? <laughs> doing great. Good to have you along on a Friday, as usual. Uh, let's start off talking about smartwatches. Who's, who's about well, we know who's building and What's going on with, the, with this Google smartwatch rumor? Yeah, we, have, we have the Financial Times here reporting that Google's working on a smartwatch. Now, the watch is reportedly being built by the Android division. Now, Google, Google Glass, which I can never say, is built by Google's experimental X-Lab. The Android team's involvement would suggest that Google sees the product as something that could be marketed quite uh, quickly. The Financial Times says that Google's watch has nothing to do with that Samsung smartwatch that's been rumored for a couple of uh, weeks now. A 2011 Google patent shows a watch with a flip-up display that would give you notifications on your phone, and it also did some augmented reality things. So if you looked through your watch, that little glass, you'd be able to get in, uh, extra information. Darren, assuming Google's actually working on a smartwatch, is there anything unique that Google could bring to this since they have all these services that could pull you into wearing a Google Watch? You know, I have no idea what it is that would actually make this product kind of boom because this has existed before. But then again, the same thing has happened in previous uh, devices. Think about the smartphones. I mean, we've had trios before iPhones, but then suddenly it's like iPhone comes out and everybody's OMG, make iPhones. Uh, same thing with e-readers, they existed before, suddenly the Kindle and OMG Kindles, uh, tablets, the uh, iPad OMG tablets. See where I'm going with this. Uh, there's, I've actually tried out some of these like Android companion watches, the Sony ones have been crap. Um, and I just hope that somebody can figure out what it is that actually make these tick, because if they can crack that, then, you know, we'll, we'll just, all get one. We'll make a smartphone tick. I mean, smart watch yes. tick. Get it? Because yes. uh -huh, it's a clock. Uh -huh. I'm sick of these uh -huh. uh, smart watches Are before you? there's even a smart watch for me to buy and use. <laughs> I, 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 I have smart watch fatigued out. Well, I mean, you've tried out wearable technology. Sure. You've had the fuel bands and yeah. there's Fitbits out there, all kinds of ridiculous things. Uh -huh. is, is having a smarter watch something anybody wants out there? I mean, yeah. if everybody's making it, there must be a demand, right? 
Well, well for, uh, reportedly making it. Nobody yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think there's. A, it's a combination of oh, we we've been talking about the Apple iWatch, you know, or whatever it's going to be called, and then it's like oh, okay, Samsung's working on something too, and and you know, the other day we talked a little bit about it's. It's almost like a defensive move, right? It's just Apple's not the only company who's doing this. So all of a sudden, it kind of brings down the cool factor a little bit because it's just, oh, that's what all the companies <clears> are doing. <throat> I was at this, uh, I was at this big like charity event last night, and there, just for whatever reason, there, there were several people there who were wearing Google glasses. Google glasses? Oh, yeah, I think so. Not Google goggles. It's I always get those two confused. Google. Glasses. And I mean, they look so ridiculous and then you kind of like you sort of look at them and then the people sort of look back at you like what are you looking at but they know what you're exactly what yeah. you're looking at and it's sort of like this, this, this silly okay glass thing. what are you looking at so i think i think to myself hey if google can put together some sort of a watch device that doesn't look as nerdy as the glasses maybe they'll have something but it seems almost a little far-fetched that it's like i don't know i mean how, how much wearable tech is google actually working on do we have a i uh, would have a google belt some Google, you know, knee braces. Where does it end? That's a good question. Headbands. So, Tom, do you think there's anything about today's technology that would make this wave of smartwatches possible or, or something that'd be usable? Well, no. I think it's I think it's in the design. It's not the technology. There's not. Uh, I can't think of anything that is special that is now new. Maybe the bendable glass that we keep hearing about could make it look really cool. But what somebody has to do is what Pebble tried to do and got people really excited, which is create a great design that people look at and say, yes, that works. That's what Apple did with iPhone. That's what they did with iPad. And so I don't know that they can do that. I think what's happening right now, though, is because of Pebble. And because of the rumors of Apple doing this, now everybody's got a Me Too approach. And we're going to see a lot of substandard, average, abortive attempts at this because it's not something that a company felt the need to do or even had desired to do. They kind of just felt they had to do it. I mean, one of the things about a watch in general is that it's just a small display. So to interact with it, I still have some real trepidation when it comes to that. Because this idea of like, oh, you can have a phone on your, on your wrist. Like dialing a number isn't so easy. Maybe with voice recognition technology, what it is, or maybe pairing via Bluetooth or or one of these technologies or Wi you know Wi-Fi Direct, something mm -hmm. that gets these devices talking. Maybe that's the the hook now that'll make it uh, worthwhile. Because in the older days, you just you'd have to like I had a Palm PDA watch. I'm one of those guys, and so you'd have to sync it. This is that is not the way you want to have it. And the battery would die like after four mm -hmm. hours. Not good for a watch when you want to check the time. Also, isn't it funny that we're actually calling these watches? It's, it's sort of like, you know, the smartphone. I mean, it's a phone, but it's all sorts of other things. But we just call it a phone because that's how, you know, it's just what we're used to. At one point, that's all you did with, well, I mean, with, with it, a phone is you made calls. It's like it's a bracelet. It's a computer wrist computer. You know what I mean? It's like we say watch because that's all what things used worn, to be. Yeah, but the time wrist. is only going to be a small part of what this is, you know, what the all this stuff is going to be capable of. It's probably of. safer to call it a watch because I think when Intel tried to call it a mobile internet device, nobody wanted to buy MIDs. Call it a tablet. Well, that's hey, cool. Hey, guess what? They called it a watch and still nobody wanted to buy it. What about it. cuff? A cuff? Yeah, smart cuff. <laughs> Fancy. That explains its, its gigantic width because you're going to need a lot of screen real estate and a huge battery on there. A wrist so, choker. So what I think is, I as, I as you point out, and I think this is actually specific to the tech industries, you say if everyone's making one, there must be demand. But I think it's actually the reverse sometimes in the tech industry where if enough people make one, there will be demand. And Sarah, you ask, where does it end? And I hope it ends when our pockets are free. Liberate our pockets from our wallets, our keys, and our smartphones. That's what that's what glass is going to do, but they have to make context out of it before that. But there's that. so <laughs> much other stuff that I have to carry around in my big old bag. Oh, right. Well, and not to mention. What are you going to put in your big old bag to justify buying the big old bag, right? A smart bag. Oh, Tom. You need a smart bag. I can fill it. A smart yeah, bag. That's right. <laughs> it's not just a bag to hold things. It's also cloud storage. Speaking <laughs> of storage, who's winning the storage wars, Sarah? Well, Tom, it's funny that you ask because it happens to be Apple. Yeah, new data from Strategy Analytics says the combination of iCloud and iTunes Match accounts for 27% of cloud storage usage, at least in the United States. This was uh, a poll taken during uh, third quarter of 2012. And you might say, okay, well, who's in second place? Probably Google or Amazon or something like that. Actually, no, it's Dropbox. Dropbox is in second place at 17%. And that's without any sort of entertainment service on top of that. But uh, it was noted 
in the study that 45% of Dropbox users do use the uh, the cloud storage uh, offered by the company for saving music. Um, but again, it's Dropbox kind of lets you do whatever you want, uh, which is which is interesting to me. I mean, I, I think Dropbox has become really the 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 ubiquitous name of cloud storage, is sort of the Kleenex of cloud storage. Uh, if you if you if you could if you could make that comparison, I do you use Dropbox for anything as far as saving music goes? I use Dropbox for much everything at this yeah. point. I mean, it used to be that I, I thought the idea was silly, and then I started using a lot of devices at once: tablets, laptops, mm -hmm. borrowing devices. That's when I can use Dropbox all the time. I mean, the thing that Dropbox did early on was make it really simple to understand what was going on. This folder that you have here is going to be synced to everything else. I mean, this you could do this with R-Sync. You could do this with your own network. It was kind of nuts, but they made it really simple. And I think you're right, Sarah. It actually is becoming a bit like Kleenex because you're like, <laughs> oh, uh, it's, it's like Dropbox. You can always explain something by saying it's like Dropbox because yeah. what's iCloud? Oh, it's like Dropbox. Okay. Don't say it's like MobileMe because nobody knows what that means. Darren, uh, you know, Dropbox recently announced that it was acquiring Mailbox, uh, the, the email service. Mailbox actually just announced that it's taken its one millionth reservation. This doesn't mean that all these millions of people can use Mailbox yet because it's rolling out slowly. Do you see Dropbox? I don't know. I, it, you know, it's, it's so, everyone knows Dropbox as cloud storage. Got it. Online in the cloud. How is, how is the company going to change with this whole email service as well? Well, I don't think you can stick around as a company just being, hey, we make that file on this computer show up on that computer. Uh, it, it's it's done, done, and done. So, you know, they need to keep trying things. And I think it's, you know, good on them for finding a tiny startup that they can put a lot of uh, energy behind. And if you can still associate that, you know, like I as was saying, the simplicity of, oh, it's like Dropbox uh, to to mail or anything else that's you know, complicated these days, which is kind of crazy to think. It's 2013 and getting a file from one place to another is still hard. But uh, but yeah, do the same thing to email. I think they totally could. Yeah, the brilliance of Dropbox is that they make your computer's hard drive appear on all your computers, no matter where you are, on any computer. You don't even have to have pre-installed it, right? So that's what a lot of people make the best use of it for is it's just my file system. It's become the cloud file system. So adding Mailbox is interesting because that indicates to me that Dropbox is saying we want to be more than just the file system. We want to be your cloud operating system. And we'll start with the most used client piece of software that people use, which is email, and see see how that goes. Yeah, I, I, the whole thing's fascinating. Uh, Dropbox has made such a transformation, really, even in the last year. I mean, so much more emphasis on, yes, we're cloud storage, but we want to look nicer. Yes, we're cloud storage, but we're focused on uh, images and photos and media. Yes, we're cloud storage, but now we've got this, you know, well-designed kind of uh, up-and-coming email system. So, uh, I don't know. Watch out Apple, I guess. Well, the thing is, when Tom mentioned Watch this, out Google. I, I just reformatted, I reformatted my computer, not even worry about the files I had, because as long as I install Dropbox, I got everything back, because that's where I keep all my important stuff. I'll just get it back yes. anyway. So, to heck, to heck I, with this idea. I'm right there with you. Remember when we used to, like, partition our hard drives for, like, the operating system versus our documents, and now all the docs are in the cloud. I don't even think about it. I do the same thing now. Yeah, it's interesting. Now, all of this stuff is a lot costlier if you're Australian, because everything software costs like 50% more than the U.S. counterpart. That's actually a number from the consumer advocacy group Choice. We did that story about how it was cheaper to actually fly from Sydney, Australia to Los Angeles to buy a copy of Photoshop here than it is to just buy it off of the store shelves in Australia. They block you from buying it over the web and downloading it. So the Australian Parliamentary Committee conducted a special investigation of price gouging uh, of software in, the, in Australia. Yesterday, begrudgingly, three executives from Microsoft, Adobe, and Apple showed up. Here's what they said. I want to hear what you guys think of this. I'll put all three out there, and, and then uh, and you guys tell me what you think. Microsoft said, quote, prices are set according to local competition. They're like, this is the price people buy it at. That's, that's all there is to it. Uh, Adobe said Australians, for their extra, you know, 50% of the money, get personalized service. And they made some remarks about how it just costs more. You got higher taxes, salaries are higher in Australia. It just costs more to do business here. 
Apple claimed that most of their products are actually very similar. Many of their products are very similar in price from the U.S. to Australia, which is almost parity. I think it's 95 Australian cents for one U.S. dollar. Uh, Apple said it's iTunes prices that have the big difference, and that's not their fault. That's the copyright holders. Quote, the content industry still runs with perhaps old-fashioned notions of count country borders or territories or markets. Uh, now, Adobe did cut their prices 20% the day before they were scheduled to testify uh, in a little reaction to this. But, uh, Darren, what, is, what does this make you think? Like, why are they? Uh, so, do you buy any of these arguments? Well, okay, so I, to be honest, I understand the boxed copy thing. If you go into a retail store, there's meat space uh, money tied to that. Uh, but I don't buy the whole, you know, global corporations and governments treating the internet as if it were somehow. Uh, tied to the the old border system, I kind of I look at it as an abstraction layer that doesn't see those borders. And I say, if you're in the AU uh, or if in, you're in um, Australia, just VPN to the states, get a prepaid get a credit card here. They're nothing, and um, and fight the system. That's cheaper than flying to LAX. What do you think of this? Yeah, it really is. I think Microsoft's dead on. The flat out, this is this is economics. Microsoft and these companies are getting away with this because people are still paying for it. Once people start revolting like this or there, these public hearings and Adobe cuts the price 20% and there's enough light on the subject, I mean, customers are going to get angry enough to go, wait a second, I could do what Darren's saying. I could just get this cheaper if I do a little extra work or if I'm nuts, I could fly all the way over to the States to get it. It's just, this is economics and they're just getting away with it. Get the environmentalists into this mess. You know, all the jet fuel and the birds that are dying because of all the planes of people flying into LAX. Get them on board, and then then we'll see some prices dropping. Okay. So anytime somebody you see a, somebody with a box copy of CS, CS6 throw like a bucket of red paint on them, <laughs> you murderers! You kill no, all those I birds. A, that that argument would make sense to me if if the prices were closer. But why is it? 50% more in Australia. I don't buy that it's that much more expensive there to make stuff. Oh, no. And that, and that the, and the Australians are just, you know, they're just like, well, we'll pay that much, you know, unlike those cheap Americans. Like, they block you from shopping around globally. You can't, without a VPN and a U.S. credit card, go buy it elsewhere. So you're kind of locked in. I, I mean, I seriously doubt it costs more to make the stuff there. I mean, bits are bits. I mean, how hard could this possibly be? But I'm just thinking that this market, for some reason, is willing to pay for this. That's what I don't understand. I mean, there are other countries out there that will, will have very expensive gadgets, and you'll never see that in the United States because there's not enough of, a, of mass adoption. But if a market can support that, it seems like that's what's happening in Australia. I just don't understand what's going on there. They would be like, well, we're locked. I guess they are locked in. They can't go out and around and to get something else. I mean, you're stuck on an island. What are you going to do? Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I think that has, I mean, it's a, it's a continent. Oh, yes, it's not an island. It's, it's also an island. No, I think I'm technically right, too. And you're also correct, but don't diminish my point as an island. It's an island. <laughs> but yes, it, and the it Earth costs more to ship stuff there. It's bits. Does it cost more to send it over the Internet? Well, I mean, you got that undersea pipe. I'm sure that's got maintenance costs. And right, they're getting, they're getting the whole fiber thing there. Oh, right, because they can't edge cache, you know, CS6 within the continent. Nope, impossible. They only have like one, I think they have the 256 megabytes of space in the whole. They got a 288. <laughs> <laughs> that, may, may be, that may be the real reason behind it, actually. All right, let's take a uh, quick break and thank our sponsor, Squarespace.com, the all-in-one platform that makes it fast and easy to create a professional website, mobile responsive designs, so that the beautiful template you pick, Squarespace has award-winning design, so you don't have to know anything about how to make a good-looking website. You just pick a good design, uh, populate it with your stuff, and then when you upload an image, it's resized seven times. When someone looks at your site on a phone, it adapts and it says, okay, the layout looks good on a phone, this screen size with the size of an image, and your site looks great on the mobile phone. It looks great on the tablet. It looks great on the laptop and the desktop. Squarespace.com is powerful and flexible, and they just launched an e-commerce solution, so you can sell stuff too, physical or digital goods. You get fast merchant accounts set up, one interface for order management, for tracking your orders, providing updates, printing shipping labels, adding coupons if you want. And Squarespace Commerce is included with the business plan that's $24 a month when you sign up for a year or $30 for the monthly plan. It's the best mobile experience. It's fast and easy to use, 100% drag and drop functionality. Uh, on Squarespace. It's, I use it to update Sword and Laser all the time. It's so easy. Better social media integration and exceptionally well designed, but you don't have to take our word for it. Try it for free. Sign up for a free account 
And no, put your credit card back in your wallet. You might be thinking, well, I guess I'll give them my credit card temperate. No, you don't have to give them a credit card or anything. Just try it out. Start building your website. If you do decide to purchase it and you pull out your credit card, that's your choice. But you can get 10% off your first purchase on new accounts when you use the offer code TNT3. And don't forget about free domain name registrations for annual plan subscriptions. That's squarespace.com. Use that offer code TNT3. Everything you need to create an exceptional website. Uh, I use them. I think you might like them too. And we thank them for their support of Tech News Today. All right. Uh, top of tech meme today was the story about Johnny Ive pushing for a flat design. I noticed on iPad today yesterday, Sarah, you guys were talking about the disappearance of that skeuomorphic reel to reel in the new podcast app. Yeah, it uh, was. It was. It went live during our show, and I hadn't updated. And I'm like, no, here it is. And Leo said, no, it's not there anymore. And it's true. They they did strip it out. So I as uh, what's behind this? Is is it a design change? Is that what we're hearing? Well, we might be getting a design change. Before I get to that, I want to make sure that people realize that I know that Australia's the continent has several islands. So don't write me in about that. So let's talk about this this uh, story that was floating around on the Wall Street Journal, saying that Apple's design culture is totally changing or slightly changing. Uh, last year, you know, iOS head Scott Forstall left the company, and Johnny Ive became the manager of human interface. And apparently, things are working a lot uh, cozier, as the headline reads at Apple. With the new arrangement, Apple's mobile software team is actually getting briefed about industrial prototypes earlier. Now, under Forstall, apparently iOS, the, the mobile software division, was a pretty isolated. They, weren't, they didn't know how their software was going to work with hardware at all. Uh, the journal sources say that Ive is pushing for a flatter design. He wants to make the next iOS starker and simpler. But if you're, gonna, you're not expecting giant changes. They're saying the next changes will be pretty conservative. So we might be seeing the influence of Vive with that podcasting app, dropping that bizarre reel-to-reel. -reel. Sarah, do you think that flattening iOS would make it feel less stale, or do they need more than a facelift to make it more competitive with Android? Um, I definitely think, it's, it's funny, it's like, I, you know, obviously I'm an iOS user and I'm just used to it, so it's, it's not like there's stuff that jumps out at me on a daily basis where I'm like, man, this really feels stale. It actually just feels familiar. And I think because of that, it's easy for people to be like, well, Apple, you know, they got to innovate, they got to innovate. This is all too familiar, therefore stale. Um, the whole reel-to-reel -reel on the podcast app as an example of skeuomorphism it really never bothered me. In fact, I thought it was kind of nice looking, but I understand that there are issues with that app that caused people to say, why don't you fix the issues with the app and, you know, syncing podcasts and blah, 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 rather than the silly stuff that doesn't really matter that's supposed to imitate a tape that people, you know, the younger people probably don't even know what it is. So, yeah, sure. I, I think a facelift is a good idea. I, 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 I tend to agree that there's not that much that Apple can do without completely changing iOS as far as design goes. I mean, what are we, are we, are we going to get sharp edges rather than rounded corners? I don't know. I, I'd like the Notepad app to not look like a Notepad. I think that's kind of silly. Like a um, legal pad. But it's not ruining my life. You know, it's like, I don't know. I, I'm not a designer, so I have no idea what he's got up his sleeve. But sure, I'd like to see. Uh, I'd like to see a flatter design. Why not? Tom, do you think people will get excited for a new design for iOS? I mean, it's, it's looked the same pretty much since it it started years ago. Yeah, I would. I, I've always felt like the iOS design looked a little Fisher Price. Uh, it just it just looks like a toy. And and for a while, the iPad was a toy, and it's become a, a lot more productive and a lot more useful with a lot of apps. But the but the interface still to me just the, the chiclety thing, it it served its purpose in the early days. But I would like to see a new metaphor there. And you see a lot of a lot of attempts at this with Android and and with Windows Phone and even BlackBerry OS uh, that are intriguing. I'm not saying that any one of those has really cracked it for me, but those those pull you towards saying, well, maybe that interface would work better for me. So if Johnny Ive gets in there and cracks it and comes out with an amazing interface change, I think that's, to me, more important than just the flattening of the design. I, I want to see a new interface metaphor that is an improvement, as long as it's an improvement. Darren, do you think there's some lessons that uh, Apple could learn from Android or even Windows Phone when it comes to this design? I mean, the thing is, it's kind of old, it's dated, and it does have that chiclety Fisher-Price look if you look at these little jewels all the time. Well, you know what uh, iOS does have is consistency. And so Android has had some growing pains while changing some of the metaphors for their design and saying, okay, look, this is the new ice creamy look and everybody make it ice creamy. And this is the gingerbread look and make it gingerbready. And um, 
and then the developers are slow to respond. So uh, yes, you're right. The iPhone looks like a toy, but at least everything on the iPhone looks like a toy. Uh, and and when you really get down to it, look, OS 10 has looked the same. Sorry, since 2001, essentially. Uh, and I think you know you do have to do these like design changes, these you know, little fluffy things to uh, to keep people excited. You know, like Sarah said, rounded corners. You know, what's next? Drop shadows and Helvetica. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, th- I think Apple definitely needs something. I mean, they're not redesigning their hardware very fast. Like, what, every two years, the hardware changes for the phones and the mm-hmm. tablets. Uh, if they don't have some kind of like on-the-face change of like, oh, what looks different? Because people will go, oh, that's the old one. It's the same old phone. And people, I think, are just getting... It's, I, I mean, it was an exciting product when it first came out, iOS, and now it just seems like it's lagging behind because Android is revised so often and it's changed and become very pretty. And everybody else is trying all kinds of new UIs. It seems like just to get attention, there needs to be some kind of stylistic change to make it look like it's new. I mean, maybe it's just me, but I swear when I look at, you know, the, uh, somebody's phone, it, it, like the, the home, they all look the same to me. Like Android and iOS don't look very different to me. It's a bunch of little apps they all on look a page. The same, yeah. On a on a smart device, yeah. I, I, you know, I mean, they're not wildly different. different here, you know. Yeah, if someone's customized with widgets enough, it looks wildly different. But most people don't do that. Yeah. So, I, I don't disagree with you there. <sighs> Google is killing another product. What are they killing today? Dead what have trees. killed today, Larry Page? They don't want to print stuff on trees anymore. At least not travel books. Yeah, Google is uh, going to uh, sunset the print edition of Frommers. Uh, that is the travel guide that it acquired uh, last year in 2012. Google's not commenting, although Skift, which is a travel news site, some folks that work there have reported that editors at Google have alerted them that this is going to be happening. Now, they could still keep the site alive. Digital editions could still thrive. But it sounds like the print edition uh, will be going away, which is not a huge surprise. Um, it's really funny. I was actually just rearranging some books at my house, and I have all of these old travel guides for countries that I've either been to or wanted to go to back in the day. And I can't bring myself to throw them out because they're just really nice. Uh, but they're, they get outdated really easily. You know, hotels come and go and, 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 the, and the information changes. So it's not a huge surprise, but I don't know. There's a little nostalgia as far as like lugging around those travel guides in your backpack, at least when I used to travel. Um, but this is, you know, this is kind of a growing trend, right? BBC's uh, sale of Lonely Planet happened earlier this month. Uh, they lost a lot of money on it. Uh, BBC had um, had bought the property for $200 million, um, and plans to sell it for about $78 million, so taking quite a loss on that. But, you know, it's a loss that's only going to grow, uh, grow wider. And then you think about the last few years. All right, so so what's the deal? I mean, what's the deal with 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 travel information? Uh, a few years ago, there was a recession and people were traveling less. So that's not very good for travel guide industries that are comprised of a bunch of professionals that are giving you professional advice about where to go. And then you've got crowdsourced free information like Wiki Travel or Wiki Voyage, which is an arm of Wikipedia, and sites like. TripAdvisor or Expedia where you have, I mean, it would be hard to find a hotel in the world that somebody hasn't written about on the internet somewhere with some sort of an opinion on whether it was a great place to stay or a bad place to stay. Ayaz, do you think that uh, the whole travel book industry is just a thing of the past? I think for the most part. I mean, the thing is, if you're carrying a smart device, you probably have a number of apps or books or eBooks or anything you want at your, at your, uh, at your leisure. But the thing about I think these paper books that can't be uh, diminished at all is the fact that when you have no signal and you can't access anything like Yelp or you can't access anything that gives you reviews, you do have that little freak out moment. There's always something nice to have a, a backup. But then again, I guess you could just print this out at home at this point. There's really no reason to have these books. It's just a very different world. So I remember talking to my dad a long time ago before the internet. I'm like, how do you find hotels? It was where they had books <laughs> and you would call them and you'd make a reservation. And I'm like, how? How does this even work? How'd you get there? I had a paper map, you tell me. I'm like, oh, that's just crazy. Darren, I know you just did uh, quite a bit of an extended travel. Uh, does the idea of having a paper book uh, uh, tucked away in your luggage somewhere sound uh, like uh, like the like the golden days? It, it to be yes, it sounds nostalgic, and you're right. There is something really beautiful about that. If I had a, a stack like you do of of cool place books, I wouldn't throw them out either, because just how how awesome is that? It's like it's like a nice worn leather bag or something. 
Uh, I think that for, for my travel, a month in Europe, I was using just open source or crowdsource kind of stuff. Like you said, wiki travel is fantastic. I pretty much just used wiki travel and Hipmunk to get my way through there. Um, I did actually see some people with travel books, but they, I guess I'd say not our generation. Uh, so maybe uh, over time, those will just kind of fade away. Uh, I guess at least with Fromer, this uh, definitely will. Um, and to Ayaz about that freakout moment, I did. I had that freakout moment in the U-Bahn, the, uh, the subway in, uh, in Berlin, but I had a paper map. So it's okay. Yeah, I think there's an opportunity there for somebody to come up with a, a little bit of a hybrid, maybe even a printout model where it's a downloadable app that's really easy to use because a lot of these apps, these travel apps are not easy to scan and you don't want to be walking around with your head down on your smartphone when you're in an unfamiliar area. You want to be able to scan through really quickly, bookmark mm -hmm. things, see addresses, integrate with your map there, but then make something printable that you can also keep around in case you don't have data coverage in the in the place where you're traveling or, or your battery runs out. You can have a map, you can have a few notations on there of things you need to see and how to get there. I think I think there's a business opportunity that's being missed to integrate all that stuff. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, Google owns the GAD as well. That that all started as this is a printed restaurant guide for a variety of yeah. cities. You know, that's all. It, it makes sense to transition online. It's just uh, it's the future. Yeah. And, and it's, it's from eleven and going it. away. It's just the books, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Printed edition only. It's like, you know, it's the borders of, of travel. What did go away was the iPhone of one Harry Harkamo, owner of the Jokerit hockey team. Maybe I'm pronouncing that wrong. Probably am in Finland. Uh, he's also the host previously of the Finnish version of The Apprentice and now a chat show uh, called Halixen Kansa, which means uh, Hjalis has a conversation, I, I believe, roughly translated. Harry Harkamo in Finland is known as Hjalis Harkamo. He interviewed Stephen Elop pestered him about when the Nokia 928 was coming to Finland. Elop tries to announce the 620 is coming to Finland that day. Uh, and, and then the presenter pulled out his iPhone. Jason, go ahead and let's roll this. Oh, how embarrassing. I, I don't want to have an iPhone. I want to, I want to, <laughs> Look, I want to I have can a take no care of that for you yeah. right here. There you I, go. I want to have a Nokia phone. It's gone. I want to have a Nokia phone. Because I believe in you and Good. I believe in Nokia, yes. but I want to have that Lumia 928. When do I get it? <laughs> so let me tell you what we're doing in the future. But tell me before that. <laughs> when do you... I will not, not sorry, can't answer <laughs> okay. those questions. But what I can say. Well, you want so a lot that, of people you know? are saying this is faked. It was staged. Okay, fake or staged, would it help Nokia to see Steve Elop throw a phone? Is it just because it got us talking about it? Yes. That's, I mean, it's totally staged. He's, he didn't really throw somebody's phone. I mean, like if the phone like cracked or something, that would be yeah, no, super just kind rude. Of the floor, yeah, right. it's it's it was he was making he was he was he was trying to you know make a definitive statement that iPhones just aren't necessary because Nokia is is coming back strong. I mean, you need Elop out there talking about yeah. this product. I like the idea that this interviewer was just harassing him about that 928, <laughs> which is supposed to be this aluminum beautiful phone that's supposedly coming out. And Elop refused to talk about it. It was asked for maybe like 10 times in the span of 10 seconds. So, I mean, whether he throws the phone or not, I don't think that's going to help anything. Unless you can throw the 928 and it survives. I mean, they have the 920, which is all polycarbonate, so I guess it could survive that. But it's like, okay, well, yeah, there's the phone, and Elop did it. That's If he threw it at a camera, it might be a little bit more fun. But it just sounded like just chucked a little device. Yeah, because if it was staged, it seemed kind of lame. They should have made a bigger deal out of it, well, right? Well, a lot of things that are staged end up being pretty lame, Tom. That's right. Elop's not a professional actor. That, right. is, a very good, that is a very good point. <laughs> Darren, what did you think of this? I don't know. Did after, after actually having some time in the Netherlands with some awesome hacker spaces, I want a Nokia phone. I've seen so many cool Nokia phones now. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I'm excited about it. Why are you excited about Stephen Elop throwing... <laughs> The phones? No, I feel Maybe like they could have done like a thing. better job if they had like a cutaway and then there was like, you know, you're, you're right. Elop's not an actor, but they could have at least hired some actor arms, some really strong ones to like, <laughs> you know, like, was it, you know? He, needed, know, he underhand needed a stuff. hammer. His underhand stuff isn't doing it for me. Yeah, he, he like needed a blender is what he needed. You know? yeah, yeah, he needed a blender. He, he, he needed to be like, will it blend? No. Is Nokia's phone going to blend? Yes. They're going to, you can put them in blenders. Turn them on, and they'll be indestructible. That would have gotten us talking. You well, can maybe talk, that's, you, talk on them, the blender up to your ear, and just be like, hey, guys, what's up? 
I'm on my blender phone from Nokia. Like, that's what they should do. You're right, Sarah. <laughs> I wonder if that was Elop. I'm glad we're on the same page. Can you imagine if that's Elop enraged? If that really is him really ticked off, he's like, oh, okay, I don't like what you're doing. And that's what he does. Yeah, big smile, yeah. light toss. I mean, he's the top of a company. Maybe he needs to have an even uh, persona there. Make sure he doesn't go crazy too often. I mean, he is heading up Nokia. <laughs> he you know what and Steve done? Ballmer should get together and go bowling. Well, they Ooh, used to work get together. some chairs. Yeah. <laughs> they should Maybe have he learned it from off. watching Steve Ballmer. By watching you. This has done wonders for Harry Harkimo's <laughs> profile. I, I learned all about him today from, from looking at this. So go watch his chat show. It's in Finnish. But he interviews people in English, as we just saw. Now to the gummy bearizer. <laughs> Tokyo's Fab Cafe is not just a cafe that's fabulous. It is a cafe that is also a fabricator. In fact, it's downstairs from a fabricator. And they ran a promotion... Uh, where you could create a gummy version of yourself. Yeah, the version's got a crazy slideshow how this happens. The whole process, I mean, it costs 63 bucks. They scan you, and then they make a mold of that scan, and then they pour in this gummy material. So if you wanted, you could give, at least in this story, it seems like you give your loved ones gummy versions of you. And this lady's holding like a 3D version of her own head in chocolate, which I find just creepy. Yeah, it was uh, for White Day on March 14th, which is like the... They, they On Valentine's Day in Japan, apparently, women give things to the men. And then on White Day, March 14th, men give things to women. Does anybody have any interest in making gummy versions of themselves? Sure. You yeah, think? why not? If I was in Japan and I came upon the store and they said, would you like to make a 3D image of your own head? It'll be chocolate and you can eat it. I would do it. You wouldn't be staring YOLO, at it? YOLO, I as. <laughs> <laughs> I think I said Yorick, you know, poor Yorick. You got your own head there. Fat. Yolo, Yolan, Yolar, Yolamos, all of the tenses of Yolo. This was a lot of money, though. I'm trying to find the amount, and I can't find it anymore. What, to but make one? It was yeah, it was, it was a limited number of people, and you had to pay a lot of money. It was 6,000 yen, but that's 63 bucks. Oh, that's not that much. Yeah, okay. so, I mean, it's a $63 gummy bear, or gummy U, I guess, would be worth it? Yeah. Mm. Totally worth it. Know. I'm just happy to see places like this fostering, you know, a culture of creativity, you know, like hacker spaces and things of this nature. It feels like a techie, geeky renaissance. It's good stuff. I want the mini furniture. I like that better. It's really, really cool way to get people like familiar with 3D printing and even 3D scanning. I like it. Cool thing. Yeah. I mean, if someone's like, whoa, it really looks like me. There you go. Yeah. Hey, it's gummy. It's I'm sitting on a small taste, chair, a gummy version of it. Hey, tasty. I do that. I sit on chairs. Yeah. Totally looks like a person. Well, this 3D printing thing might have legs after all. Yeah. Look, it's uh, nice. the legs off. So. <laughs> Get it? Legs? Yes. No. What's happening to this Friday show? I don't know. It's going like it's Friday. Sign. Hey, it's Liquid we Friday, right? Move to the calendar. <laughs> hey, GDC starts on Monday, the 25th. It runs all week through the 29th. And the HTC One is coming to the UK, Germany, and Taiwan next week. And North America, the Asia Pacific region, and Europe before the end of April. So hold your breath um, because you'll be able to exhale sometime in the next month. <gasps> Let's see what's incoming. Incoming message. Got a voicemail. Uh, really, really astute observation from Renard on why Facebook would implement hashtags. Hey, this is Renard Mayfield in Chicago. Uh, I want to talk about two things. One of them with the uh, hashtag on Facebook. Uh, you talked about many of the reasons why, but one of the reasons I think you all left out is uh, many people have their Twitter linked to their Facebook. So when they post a message on Twitter, it ch it updates their Facebook status. So since the hashtags will be used, uh, Facebook's like we may as well benefit from it. That's a good point. That, that is indeed true. It Andrew. Oh, oh, I guess it just oh, goes it just, on to the next one at a time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that is totally what I do. I, I all my Facebook status updates are my Twitter postings piped over there. I rarely, if ever, go to Facebook itself. So that is very clever on Facebook's part to get more interaction because when I do go to Facebook, it's because someone responded to something that posted there. And if they can find it more easily because, I, although I don't really use hashtags, but if I did, that would make sense. I got an email from James, also known as Accuzod. I don't think that Google Keep is intending to steal eyeballs away from Evernote as much as I think Google is trying to keep up with Microsoft. Google is trying very hard to steal enterprise users away from Microsoft Office, and Microsoft OneNote is a great note-taking app on the desktop and phone. Thanks. Thanks, Accuzod. 
Is overly it? dramatic news with Accuso. I uh, got another email from Scott who says, regarding your discussion of synthetic sapphire, being a 9 on the MOH's scale, diamond is a 10, so it's like the hardest material, it is extremely scratch resistant. It is not shatter resistant, though. In other words, you can purposely take a steak knife across the glass with no worries, but dropping it on your ceramic bathroom floor will likely yield a very bad result. It'll chip or spiderweb or shatter or something like that. Another caveat regarding sapphire in a cell phone application is an anti-glare or anti-fingerprint coating that might be added over the glass. Now the contact surface to the outside world is not actually sapphire fire no longer a nine on that scale putting a coating over the material seems counterintuitive but it's a common practice crap i thought we had we had we had we had, we had, not, we had, we had found the solution with sapphire it's not been cracked yet it's going to be well, so smudgy but no strong uh, <laughs> all right that uh that wraps it up for today thank you so much for joining us everybody uh we love doing this show and we love having you along with us and darren kitchen we love having you on fridays what's going on with hack five this week well, this is a special message to all of the Australian listeners who can go over to hack5.org and learn how to build their very own free and open source VPN. Yeah, it's that easy. We're going to walk you right through it. It's so simple. And then you'll have a VPN. You'll be all good. Yeah. Uh, you'll need to fly to the U.S., buy a virtual private server, set it up there, fly back. But you're going to love it. <laughs> of this. course. <laughs> but it'll be worth it. It'll pay for itself. Trust us. Yes. <laughs> H-A-K, the number five, dot org. Uh, you can also submit and vote on stories for the show at our subreddit, technewstoday.reddit.com. And you can submit what you think are the best of moments for any show on Twit at twit.tv slash best of. Helps us put together our year-end shows. You can find us on the web anytime of day, twit.tv slash TNT. Email us, TNT at twit.tv. Or give us a call, leave us a voicemail, 260-TNT-SHOW. We'll be back Monday with Dan Benjamin from 5 by five. See you then.